All right, so the next one is the major histocompatibility complex. And this is a set of genes located mostly on chromosome 6, for the most part, at least. We'll talk about some exceptions to that. They're linked set, okay, linked set of genetic loci encoding proteins that are involved in antigen processing and presentation to T cells. I'm going to make the assumption that if you're taking this class, you've at least talked about MHC molecules either in your general biology classes, in anatomy and physiology, or maybe even in some, some microbiology. So this should be a little bit of a review for you. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to go in a lot of depth on that. Now I've given an overview of it on another video, but this is for immunology type students or really uh, hardcore anatomy and physiology students. So MHC1 and then there's MHC2. Um, in humans, however, we call them HLA molecules. We'll talk about that later. But these peptides are delivered to the cell surface by MHC molecules. T cells are going to recognize and interact with the, the individual. Notice that it's just a peptide in the MHC complex. It's not like what we had seen with, with uh, T cell receptors or B cell receptors. And there's two types. There's class 1 and class 2. And we'll talk about each and every one of those later on about the functions of these. But look at the structures between them. And I think there's actually another picture that diagrams that. But this is just an overview of their their functions so you don't lose track of what's going on here. So here's a CD4 helper T cell um, and he's interacting with a macrophage. Notice that this is a antigen presentation cell. So this is going to be um, sorry, two types of T cells here. This macrophage here is going to be interacting with MHC class 2 because this is a CD4 here. Um, this is also an antigen presenting cell so this is uh, MHC class 2 interactions, but this is a CD8 cell, a cytotoxic T cell, interacting with some random cell, any cell of your body, every cell of your body, uh, except for your, your uh, red blood cells, which remember aren't really technically cells themselves, uh, having this. So this would be MHC type 1 interacting with this, holding up a flag saying, I'm sick. And so after they make contact, we're going to go ahead and kill him. And in the case of a helper T cell, with either a macrophage or it could be a dendritic cell, it's going to result in the production of cytokines or antibodies, you know, soluble effector molecules of the uh, immune system. So that's what that's showing there. All right, so MHC class 1 is a very uh, different structure than that of class 2, obviously. Even though they have similar functions, it's the variation that determines this. So for the alpha 1 and alpha 2 uh, peptides. These are the parts that come together to form the most of the peptide binding groove and really pay attention to how just how deep this binding groove is here. So it's very 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 uh, I guess convex in structure and if you could kind of see this diagram showing this in three dimension these uh, alpha helixes here are kind of just jumping out at you and then at the base of this little I mean it, it really is kind of like a bag or a satchel um, we see the beta pleated sheets there so for the beta pleated sheets here, these are the alpha-3 protein there, and then the beta-2 microglobulin. Now this is not, uh, does not come from the same gene as that of the MHC class 1 molecules itself. So these are all here, are all kind of produced together and expressed together, whereas this is kind of a separate thing here. Um, but all nucleated cells, for the most part, are going to express MHC class 1 molecules, right? Because every cell in your body is susceptible to being infected by a virus or to say cancer or something like that. An intracellular pathogen though, it's not just viruses, there's also certain bacteria and certain uh, proteasias that can get in there and, and cause damage as well. So MHC class 2, as you may have noticed, don't have that beta 2 microglobulin. There's just a beta 1 and then an alpha 1 and then an alpha 2 and then a beta 2. If I were to guess I see that they may have some homology between this and that of the um, T cell receptors, but this is just my guessing here. But notice how um, the binding groove we see here is a bit, uh, it, well, the picture here doesn't really show it in three dimensions, but it's a bit more wide. Uh, I think the picture kind of tries to demonstrate that. It's a little bit more wider. It can have larger peptides come in than that of MHC class 1. But what is the function of this? This is the function of expressing primary antigen presenting cells, all right? So no, my skin cells do not have MHC class 2. My skin cells have MHC class 1. And this is predominantly dealing with extracellular pathogens, pathogens that have been phagocytized, pathogens that we've eaten and that are T 
taking place through receptor-mediated endocytosis or through phagocytosis. Um, process within a vesicle, and we'll talk about the mechanism of that in a little bit more detail. Okay, so both the MHC class 1 and MHC class 2 have specific cells of the adaptive immune system that they're going to interact with. So CD8 here is going to bind to the alpha-3 domain of the MHC class 1. And one of the things you may want to notice about the CD8 co-receptor here, that's what we call those things, the co-receptors, which is the difference between a helper T-cell and a cytotoxic T-cell, is that this is going to not only stabilize this interaction here, but this is also going to induce a conformational chain as well and play other roles in terms of the signaling processes here. But notice that it's the alpha-3 that's going to bind with that of the CD8 receptor, whereas with the CD4 receptor, it's going to bind to the beta 2 domain. So just the beta 2 domain there, not the beta 1 there. Um, and then this also plays a role in, in, in how this... So I guess the point that I'm making here, the point that this diagram is pointing out, is that T cells interact not just with the peptides, but with the individual MHC proteins themselves. Okay? The alpha and beta chains are going to interact with the peptides, and then the co-receptors are going to interact with the MHC molecules. So that's, I guess, the point that I'm trying to, to really drive home with this here. What we didn't mention, and I feel like it's a shame that we didn't, but I'm just going to give you a heads up that these are polymorphic genes. And that's where a lot of their variation comes from. They have a lot of different um, genes that encode for them. I'm just going to make a note that there's a lot of them. There's MHC type 1 and MHC type 2, and I'm going to do that in this very vibrant color here. The type 1 part is made up of two, I guess, distinct protein structures. There's the alpha subunits and then the beta 2 microglobulin, which we just abbreviate that as B2M. And then we also have the alpha subunits. Abbreviate them kind of as heavy chains. Well, so then I, the terminology that I was saying earlier of calling them subunits is not accurate. There's three parts of these. There's alpha-1, alpha-2, and then alpha-3. Again, if you're Greek, I'm sorry. I'm probably very offensive because of how bad I am at writing my Greek. So alpha-1 and alpha-2 are going to come together, and they're going to function in forming of the pepti peptide loading site. I don't feel like I stress this a lot, but understand that this is just peptides only peptides and only small pieces of peptides in the context of MHC type 1 that we're dealing with here. Very small and they're only peptides. Okay, So because of that they don't really have the polymorphic genes that we had talked about earlier. That's enough to provide enough variation to where we can have enough presentation of every other thing. We don't have to take into account things like tertiary structure of proteins or uh, glycosylated proteins, phosphorylated proteins, uh, things like that. Now this peptide loading site is going to contain both self-peptides and then non-self-peptides. So at any given point in time, so on say one of my skin cells on my finger or on my face right now, they're expressing on their surface MHC type 1 proteins. And assuming that I don't have any virally infected cells, they're presenting self-proteins. They're presenting self-peptides saying, hey, everything's A-OK. -okay. And then at the instant they start to either A, not express those MHC proteins, or B, express proteins that are not self-recognized, then we get an immune response. But MHC are constitutively expressed. Now both the alpha-3 and the beta-2 microglobulin, these come together to form something known as the immu immunoglobulin-like domains. I'm going to say that they're Ig-like. Now obviously, the, if, so if we have, for example, say the beta-2 macroglobulin being in there more so, because that really is a separate structure from that of the alpha subunits, the type 1 MHC molecule is not going to be functional. It's not going to have the right conformation unless that beta-2 macroglobulin is there. Once that binds there, it undergoes a conformational change which makes it fully functional. Think of it as the last piece that it needs to, to build the fully functional Death Star. So the, once these bind here, this is a, the, really just this more so. This is going to undergo a conformational change which is going to help stabilize the peptide loading site. So this is also the binding site for the CD8 molecule, or the CD8 co-receptor, if I wanted to be more specific there. All right, so that's it for type 1. Now let's talk about type 2. 
One final note about type 1 interferon is that they have an increased uh, gene expression uh, when they are infected with viral cells. So increased gene expression upon uh, interferon response. So for type 2, there's both the alpha and then the beta chains. One of the reasons why I'm a big fan of, sh of doing concept maps is because I feel like this shows a way to compare and then contrast in ways that Venn diagrams just don't really do it for me. So for alpha, there is alpha 1 and then obviously alpha 2. So because I don't have an eraser with this pen, I'm going to go ahead and use Roman numerals 1 and then Roman numeral 2. So this is alpha 1, in case that wasn't obvious, and this is alpha 2. And you'll understand why I'm writing this later <laughs> whenever I talk about beta. So just like with beta, there's beta 1 and then beta 2. So why did I do this? Because both the alpha 1 and the beta 1 subunits come together to make the peptide binding site, or peptide loading site, whichever way you want to call it. Whereas for the 2, well, for the both the beta 2 and the, let's really drag that out there, um, for alpha 2, these guys come together to make up the immunoglobulin-like domain. The immunoglobulin-like domain obviously is going to just like over here, this is going to be the binding site for CD4 cells, or CD4 co-receptor. All right, so that's the binding site for the CD4 co-receptors. Um, if I can, I'm going to see if I can mention this here. I'm going to put this giant P for here and then a giant P here. And what that means is that both of these guys have something known as promiscuous binding specificity, which I abbreviate as PBS, but I'll write this whole thing out here. So as its name may imply, it's promiscuous with what it binds to. It's going to bind to peptides of many different amino acid sequences. So the, the specificity of this is not so much in the fact that it's the, the binding site, so much as it is into the, all the other factors that come into play. We'll talk about that with antigen processing presentation. But the last thing that I wanted to mention, I didn't have time to mention it with this, is for the peptide loading site of the type 1, the individual peptide itself, I know we've spent a lot of time here, is nine amino acids at the longest. Now with type two, um, which that makes sense if you go back to looking at the structures and how it's such a deep crevice in there with this. Now for type two, the actual peptide loading site in this context can be anywhere from up to at the most 25 amino acids in the length. So peptides for type two are a bit larger than that of what we would have with type one. But that's it for MHC complexes, playing a role in not only showing viral uh, infections, but also showing that tissues are compatible with other things as well.